Daenerys arrives on Dragonstone for the first time since she was born, accompanied by Tyrion, Missandei, Varys, and Grey Worm. She wastes no time exploring the home of her ancestors, removing one of Stannis Baratheon's old banners in the process. After examining the painted table of Westeros, Daenerys asks her hand when they can begin their conquest. Later, watching the weather, members of her council comment on how it relates to the night of her birth and the storm that came with it. Contrary to what she would have believed, she says that Dragonstone doesn't feel like home, but Tyrion reassures her that they won't have to stay for long. She then comments on the fact that Cersei only controls parts of Westeros, to which Varys says this is due to the fact that many nobles despise her. Daenerys then grills Varys on his true loyalties, comparing his desire for a Targaryen restoration to that of Viserys, in which she also states that Varys only supported her when it suited him, and followed Viserys until his death. She also questions why he betrayed her father for Robert, to which he explains that he would have been executed if he had not done so and that he obeyed Robert's strength in contrast to Ares's cruelty. Varys doesn't mention that Robert had rescinded his order that Daenerys be killed before he died. Varys then makes it clear that he is truly a representative of the common people, and that his loyalty to them ultimately outweighs his loyalty to any monarch, though he still believes Daenerys is the one most worth following. Daenerys then requests that Varys make a promise to advise her when she goes wrong, rather than betray her, to which he concedes. Daenerys is then visited by Melisandre, who is welcomed due to the number of red priests who supported Daenerys in Marine. Melisandre is immediately pardoned for siding with Stannis and explains to Daenerys that she may have something to do with the prophecy of the prince that was promised. Daenerys points out that she is, no prince, prompting Missandei to explain that, in the language Melisandre used, the prophecy is gender-neutral. Melisandre further states that Daenerys has a role to play in the prophecy, as does another, the king in the north, Jon Snow. Tyrion is surprised and questions Melisandre, confirming she is talking about the Jon Snow who is the illegitimate son of Eddard Stark. When Daenerys asks if Tyrion knows him, Tyrion explains he travelled with Jon to Castle Black. Varys asks about Jon, and Daenerys learns of his role as the king in the north and of unifying the northerners and the wildlings against a common enemy. Clearly intrigued by the sound of this man, Daenerys requests that Tyrion write a letter to Jon after Tyrion tells her that Jon will prove himself a valuable ally in Daenerys's bid to claim the Iron Throne, particularly as the crimes committed by the Lannisters against his family give him enough reason to want Cersei overthrown, asking him to come to Dragonstone and bend the knee. Daenerys later stops an argument between Ilaria Sand and Tyrion over the assassination of Marcella Baratheon, to which Daenerys replies Ilaria must respect her hand. She also agrees with Tyrion over Yara's idea to attack King's Landing immediately and that the Unsullied should attack Casterly Rock while the Westerosi armies lay siege to the capital. When everyone has left the chamber, she requests an audience alone with Olena Tyrell. Daenerys then tells her that she knows Olena is on her side due to their mutual hatred for Cersei, rather than a love for Daenerys herself. In response, Olena encourages Daenerys to be a dragon, rather than a sheep, like the other high lords and ladies. When Jon and Davos Seaworth arrive at Dragonstone, Daenerys sits in the keep's throne room, waiting for them. After their entrance, Masande speaks Daenerys's name and announces her many titles, which stand in stark contrast to Davos simply announcing Jon as, the king in the north. Initially, Daenerys assumes that he has come to bend the knee to her, as she is the rightful heir to the Iron Throne, and declared how Jon's ancestor Torren Stark bent knee to the Targaryens and was named Warden of the North reminding that the eras wherein their houses collaborated brought prosperity to the Seven Kingdoms. John, however, reminds her that any fealty House Stark owed House Targaryen ended when her father murdered his grandfather and uncle, though he accepts her apology on behalf of House Targaryen for the crimes committed against the Starks and he agrees she is not to blame for her father's sins, and states that his purpose is different, he has come to ask for her help in the coming fight against the Night King and his army of the dead to which Daenerys would also need Jon's help in order to expunge the Night King's army. Daenerys becomes increasingly annoyed by Jon's refusal to bend the knee and tells him that since her marriage to Khal Drogo, she's been through countless ordeals of every kind, but has lived through all of them and even managed to take advantage of certain situations, all because of her faith in herself. That is the reason she believes that since her birth, she has been destined to rule Westeros. However, John insists that her kingdom will be nothing more than a graveyard should the Night King win. 
Davos starts stating John's own achievements during his time as Lord Commander of the Night's Watch up until the moment he was crowned king by the Northmen, all of which John has achieved not by virtue of inheritance, as he has none due to being an illegitimate son, but rather, by his deeds and the faith his fellow Northmen have in him whose respect John gained as a leader. Both Daenerys and Tyrion notice something off in Davos's speech about John, taking a knife to the heart. As Davos speaks of John, it becomes apparent to Daenerys that John, like her, did not take power for the sake of taking it and his journey to his present standings was every bit as fraught with sacrifice and hardship as hers. Tyrion takes up and urges them to kneel before Daenerys and, after the war against Cersei, their combined forces would defend the North. John refuses both because it may take longer to win the Iron Throne from Cersei and, by then, it may already be too late as at that point the Night King's army may have already bypassed the wall and marched further down south into the Seven Kingdoms. John also explains that he doesn't know Daenerys at this point, that her claim to the throne rests on her descent from a king his family helped overthrow and he was chosen by his people to lead, so he must lead them as well as he can. Daenerys concedes that this is fair but counters by saying that if he insists on that view, she will count him as a rebel against her rule. She ends when Varys whispers the events of the assault on the Targaryen fleet by telling Jon that he is not yet in her captivity, leading to Jon and Davos exiting the throne room. Varys then tells Daenerys that Ilaria, the Sand Snakes, Yara and the remaining Greyjoy forces are either dead or captured. She then asks if they have all been taken under control of Euron, the instigator of the attack, unknown of Theon Greyjoy's abandonment of Yara and his escape from the attack. Sometime later, Tyrion talks her into letting Jon mine and make weapons of the dragon glass. He insists that if Jon is to be their ally, some good-willed intent must be shown from their side and as they have no use for the dragon glass, they have nothing to lose by letting Jon have it. When she goes back to Davos's saying of Jon, taking a knife to the heart, Tyrion brushes it off as a tall tale. Daenerys and Jon meet in private at a spot overlooking the sea and the dragons, which roam the skies. She expresses similarities between them in having lost loved ones, Rhaegar and Viserys for Daenerys, Rob, and Rickon for Jon. Daenerys explains that since people once thought dragons were gone for good, they should examine what they believe they know, and Jon realizes Tyrion has been talking to both Daenerys and him. Daenerys reminds Jon she won't let Cersei stay in power and Jon responds he didn't expect she would. When Daenerys also explains she hasn't changed her mind about which kingdoms belong to the throne, Jon says he hasn't changed his mind about refusing to bend the knee either. Both come to a standstill until Daenerys offers to help him mine the dragon glass he needs and provide what he needs to do so. Jon asks her if she believes him now about the army of the dead, to which Daenerys responds by telling him to hurry and begin his work. Tyrion then informs her of his plan for the Unsullied to take Casterly Rock through a secret passageway he used during his whoring days. However, this leads to the Unsullied ships being burned by Euron, causing them to be trapped at Casterly Rock. Daenerys ultimately loses another ally during the sack of Highgarden, in the forced suicide of Olenna and the loss of the Tyrell army. Days later, Daenerys strolls around Dragonstone with Missandei at her side, both wondering about the fate of the Unsullied. Missandei reveals to the Queen that certain things happened between her and Grey Worm, before they are interrupted by Jon Snow. He leads Daenerys through an underground cave, whose walls are rich in dragon glass. He shows her ancient wall drawings, which were made by the children of the forest. They depict the children themselves as well as the first men and how they banded together to defeat their common enemy, the White Walkers. She is awestruck and starts becoming swayed by Jon's sayings, promising to defend the North with him when he bends the knee. Although he insists his people would never accept a southern ruler after everything they suffered, Daenerys asks him whether his own pride is more important than the lives of the Northmen. After they leave the cave, Tyrion and Varys deliver news of the Unsullied's incomplete victory at Casterly Rock and the fall of Highgarden. Enraged at the loss of her allies, Daenerys snaps at Tyrion, accusing him of devising soft plans to protect his family and impulsively suggests flying to the Red Keep and burning it to the ground. She then turns her attention to Jon and asks for his advice. He tells her that all her followers saw her accomplish the impossible and believe she can do so yet again. However, using the dragons to destroy the castles and cities of Westeros would make her no different than the ones she is trying to overthrow. When the combined armies of Jaime Lannister and Randall Tarly prepare to finally leave Highgarden, 
Daenerys's horde of Dothraki attacks them as they cross the plains of the Reach, with Daenerys herself leading the charge riding on the back of Drogon. The Lannister Tali infantry assume an anti-cavalry shield wall, but Daenerys has Drogon blast them with dragonfire, clearing a path through the formation for her warriors to charge. Although the Lannister and Tali forces fight fiercely and inflict heavy casualties against the Dothraki at first, the combination of dragonfire and cavalry charges overwhelms them, and their formations soon fall apart. Jaime briefly rallies a group of archers to target Daenerys as she dives again, hoping to kill her and leave her forces leaderless, but Drogon pulls up sharply and the arrows glance harmlessly off his scales. Daenerys and Drogon launch dive bombing attacks from above to destroy the Lannister's supply convoy, and the Dothraki mercilessly slaughter every fleeing soldier they find. Seemingly out of nowhere, a giant bolt whizzes right past Drogon as he flies and Daenerys immediately heads for the scorpion to destroy it. Before she can reach it, Bronn, who is manning the weapon, manages to strike Drogon's wing, causing the dragon to wince in pain and lose his balance. After plummeting nearly to the ground, Drogon regains his balance right in front of the scorpion and incinerates it with his fire breath. He then lands on the battlefield and demolishes what's left of the scorpion with an angry swipe of his tail. Daenerys dismounts on the riverbank and tries to pull the bolt out of Drogon's shoulder. While trying to do so, she turns to see a mounted Jaime galloping towards her with a spear in hand. Drogon moves to protect his mother, shielding her behind his head and shooting a line of fire at him, only for Bronn to save him by tackling him off of his horse into the river. In the aftermath of the battle, the survivors are rounded up and taken before Daenerys. She claims they've been manipulated by Cersei and offers them a choice. Bend the knee and join her to build a better world with her, or refuse and die. As if to reinforce this point, Drogon roars menacingly from his perch behind Daenerys. Most of the survivors quickly kneel, with the exception of Randall Tarly and Dickon Tarly. Randall refuses to trade his honor for his life, claiming he has chosen his queen. Tyrion suggests she send him to the war, but Randall reminds her that she cannot, as she is not his queen. Dickon follows his father, despite Randall's protests. Daenerys accepts their choice and sentences them both to death by dragonfire, executing them. Back at Dragonstone, Jon watches as Daenerys lands Drogon in front of him. The dragon approaches Jon, who stands his ground. Drogon allows Jon to touch him, to Daenerys's astonishment. She dismounts, at which point Drogon flies off, and claims that the gorgeous beasts Jon sees are her children. Daenerys informs Jon of her victory over the Lannisters and they discuss what is needed to help people. Daenerys asks him what Davos meant by, taking a knife in the heart for his people. Jon avoids discussing his resurrection, claiming that Davos gets carried away, but before Daenerys can press him further, they are interrupted by the arrival of Jorah, who has been cured of his grayscale. Delighted, Daenerys embraces Jorah and introduces him to Jon, who tells him that his father was a great man. Inside the chamber of the painted table at Dragonstone, Daenerys holds a meeting with her advisors, as well as Jon and Davos. Daenerys extends her relief to Jon at his discovery that his half-siblings Arya and Bran are still alive and at Winterfell after years of believing them dead. Jon, having received Bran's warning of the Night King marching towards Eastwatch by the sea and fearing that the Night King will make it past the wall, states that he must go home to Winterfell and prepare to fight the army of the dead. Daenerys questions his ability to do so with the modest amount of men sworn to fight for him, and Jon requests her help once again. She refuses noting that Cersei wins if she abandons her cause to take the Iron Throne. Unsure of how to proceed, Tyrion presents the idea of bringing evidence of the Army of the Dead to Cersei, in the hopes of convincing her to join the fight against the White Walkers. Jon decides to lead an expedition north of the Wall to capture a White and bring it south to King's Landing. Daenerys, at first, doesn't agree with Jon's departure but is convinced by Tyrion's confidence in the mission. As Jon, Jorah, and the group prepare to depart on boats for Eastwatch by the sea, Daenerys and her entourage arrive and bid Jorah farewell. Jorah quips that he is used to saying farewell. When Jon and Daenerys bid farewell, he says that there is a chance that he might not return and that she won't deal with the king in the north anymore. Daenerys tells him that she's grown used to him. Then Jon wishes her well in the wars to come. Along with Tyrion, Daenerys watches as Jon, Jorah, and the rest of the party depart on their boats for Eastwatch. Some time later, Daenerys discusses Drogo, Jorah, Dario and Jon Snow with Tyrion. 
A concerned Daenerys says that they're heroes who all do stupid, brave things and die. Tyrion notes that all the men she's named have all fallen in love with her. Daenerys dismisses this about Jon, claiming that he is, too little, for her. But Tyrion thinks Jon has feelings for her. When Daenerys clarifies she knows Tyrion is brave, that's why she chose him as her hand, they discuss Cersei and how to take King's Landing. Explaining fear is all Cersei has, Tyrion tells Daenerys that it made the Lannisters' power brittle. When Daenerys says Aegon got a long way with fear, Tyrion tells Daenerys she needs to be different from who came before her if she wishes to break the wheel. The negotiations with Cersei will be difficult and Tyrion cautions Daenerys that his sister will likely try to provoke her. He lightly admonishes her for losing her temper and burning Randall and Dickon, but Daenerys says it was necessary. Tyrion believes Daenerys acted too hastily instead of exploring other options and giving the Tarleys time to think. He wants Daenerys to defeat her enemies, as he believes in the world she wants to build. The subject turns to her succession and he notes she told him she can't have children. Daenerys wants to set this discussion aside until after she wins the throne, and leaves. Later, she receives a raven from Gendry calling for help beyond the wall. Against Tyrion's advice, insisting Jon knew the risks of the mission and everything they've done will be for nothing if she dies beyond the wall, and therefore unable to break the metaphorical wheel, Daenerys flies north with her dragons, leaving her army on Dragonstone. She arrives in time to save Jon and his party, burning countless whites and landing for them to climb up. The Night King, however, impales Viserion with an ice spear through the throat, killing him. Enraged, Jon sets his eyes on the Night King but as the monster reaches for another spear, he then shouts at Daenerys to leave. Reluctantly, she and the others flee just as the Night King throws another spear at Drogon, which misses, and they return to Eastwatch. Daenerys stands on the wall with Jorah, who ushers her to leave, but stays, obviously concerned for Jon. When he returns on the horse of Benjen Stark, who sacrificed his life to save him, Daenerys is visibly elated and sees Jon's stab wounds for the first time when they remove Jon's frozen clothes, realizing the truth of what Davos said about him. Daenerys sits at Jon's side until he wakes up. A distraught Jon apologizes for Viserion's death, believing it his fault, but Daenerys insisted she needed to see the scale of the threat facing them for herself. You have to see it to know. Now I know. She reveals that the dragons are the only children she will ever have, promising that they will destroy the Night King forever. John thanks her and calls her, Danny, to her amusement, though remembering that is was what her brother Viserys used to call her and she tells John that's not the company he wants to keep. John then calls her, my queen, and pledges fealty to her, moving Daenerys to tears. When she asks what the northern lords who have sworn to him will make of this choice, John gently assures Daenerys that like him, they will come to see her for the good person she truly is. Daenerys tearfully responds that he hopes she deserves it and clasping each other's hands, John assures her she does. They share a moment before Daenerys insists John rest and she leaves. At the dragon pit, the various factions meet. Cersei, Jaime, Kyburn and Euron represent the Iron Throne. John, Davos, and Brienne represent the North and Daenerys's court. When Cersei demands to know where her rival is, the Dragon Queen makes a suitably dramatic entrance on Drogon's back, with Rhaegal flying overhead. After making apologies for her lateness, they proceed in getting the meeting on track. Tyrion, Daenerys, and Jon try to warn Cersei of the greater threat coming for them all, but she dismisses it as a ploy to trick her into lowering her defenses. To prove their claims, the Hound returns with the crate containing the White, which is worryingly silent. Sandor gets the crate open, but there is still no movement. He finally gives the crate a massive kick, which prompts the enraged white to launch itself out and charge toward the nearest target, Cersei, appropriately enough. Visibly horrified, the Lannister Queen and her allies recoil in horror as Sandor pulls the white back on a chain, its claws inches from Cersei's face, and manages to slice the creature in half when it turns to attack him. The assembled look on in shock as the white's upper half still moves around. John steps forward and picks up the white's discarded hand, using a torch provided by Davos to demonstrate how fire can be used to stop them. He then uses a dragon glass dagger to the heart to end the white's upper half, bluntly stating that if they don't win the coming war, such a fate awaits every person in Westeros. A horror-struck Jaime asks how many whites are coming, and Daenerys tells him the army of the dead numbers at least 100,000. Euron asks if the whites can swim. When John responds, 
No. Euron announces to Cersei his intention to withdraw the Iron Fleet back to the Iron Islands. He declares that he has been over the whole world and has never been terrified until now. On his way out, Euron tells Daenerys to retreat to her island while he returns to his own and to come find him when they are the only two left alive. Seemingly convinced, Cersei immediately offers terms. Satisfied that Daenerys is concerned with the army of the dead, Cersei will not withdraw her troops, but will guarantee that they will not hinder the Targaryen or Northern forces in any way during the battle against the White Walkers. She refuses to deal with Daenerys at all, however, and calls on Jon Snow, as King in the North and Ned Stark's son, to keep the truce and to stay out of any future conflict between Cersei and Daenerys. Jon, however, says that he cannot serve two queens, and reveals to all assembled that he has already declared for Daenerys, infuriating all three Lannisters present. Declaring that there will be no truce if it is just her and Daenerys, Cersei storms out, content to let the Starks and Targaryens battle the undead alone and then deal with whoever emerges victorious from that conflict. Meanwhile, Daenerys and Tyrion rip into Jon over his ill-advised action. Tyrion suggests that learning to lie just a little might be a good skill. Jon responds by arguing that while such an attitude may or may not have contributed to getting his father killed, if no one is willing to speak the truth, then everyone's word is worthless, and lies will not help them win the coming fight. Tyrion reluctantly decides that he will go and try to talk some reason into Cersei alone. Daenerys and Jon protest, fearing Cersei may have him killed out of spite, but Tyrion insists it's the only way if they don't want everything they've done to be for nothing and bids them wait. While Tyrion goes to talk to Cersei, Daenerys and Jon discuss the dragons and how her ancestors caged them, and in turn, her family became less impressive as the power of the dragons waned, that they became like everyone else. Jon responds that Daenerys is not like everyone else. When Daenerys confides she was made infertile by Miri Mazdur, Jon questions this, particularly when she admits it was Miri Mazdur who told her she was infertile. Their conversation is interrupted by the return of all three Lannisters. Cersei has agreed to work with Daenerys, but not by keeping her troops back. The Lannister army will march north to fight alongside the Starks and Targaryens. In the chamber of the painted table, Daenerys and her court discuss logistics. It will take the Dothraki a fortnight to reach Winterfell, and the plan is to have Jon and the Unsullied cross the sea by ship and meet them at White Harbor. Jorah Mormont points out that the North is not really safer for her than anywhere else, as someone with a memory of Robert's rebellion and an idea of becoming a hero could easily take her out with a single crossbow bolt. He suggests she fly to Winterfell to avoid any potential unpleasantness. Jon counters that Daenerys ride with them so that the North can see her as a liberator and ally. After a moment's consideration, Daenerys decides to sail north with Jon. Jorah, suspecting a different reason for her decision, throws her a look, which she notices but avoids. Some time after setting sail, Jon knocks on the door of Daenerys's cabin. She answers and meets his gaze without words. After a moment, he enters, and, with their eyes still locked on one another, shuts the door. Unaware of their biological connection to one another, they finally give in to the burgeoning passion between them and make love. Unbeknownst to both of them, Tyrion had also been on his way to speak with his queen, and had seen Jon enter the cabin.